for good morning from Brisbane, Australia. It's really nice to be here. Um, this is our first time back together, actually, physically in this room. This is where we normally gather. Um, and we're very thrilled, I think, to have the opportunity to um, participate in this uh, e-event. Um, LCT Queensland is a very low key group. We've been together since I think 2017 um, loosely. And um, I think before we get stuck into it today, because we've got a couple of hours, it's worth emphasizing that the dynamic of our group has really just naturally always been a kind of free form discussion type group. We're not overly structured in the way that we um, do things usually. And uh, I think we, what we've benefited from and what we are, I think, hoping to bring into this setting um, is this kind of sense of openness of discussion of kind of low stakes interaction to talk about LCT in relation to it, the topic that we'll be talking about today. But really, I, I think underlying that, it's thinking about this as a forum for just general learning and, and free exchange of ideas and, you know, when we get together, often it will, it will, these whiteboards will fill up and there's no method to that madness necessarily. Um, but we, I think we find it energizing and it, for us, it's or certainly for myself, it's a really big part of um, what keeps me, um, you know, motivated and inspired to just be um, thinking in this, in, in this space that we're, um, that we're working with. So that's just a really general, you know, introduction to us, but Andrew on the end and Ken here, and my name's Jack. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to Ken to kick off the session. As you can see, we're quite an eclectic group here as well. I'm from the business school. Jack is from the School of Music and Andrew is from the School of Languages and Culture. Um, generally, our discussions are around assessment, um, education policies about SFL and how SFL and LCT can be used to model different kinds of teaching practices. I also have a couple of um, the uh, PhDs supervisees who join into our session from time to time, as well as Natalie from the UK. Yeah. Um, so in today's session, um, in the spirit of LCT 3.5, we'll try to keep this uh, as much a workshop as possible. It will be divided into two parts. In the first part or the first hour, we have a sort of a discussion um, between us and we will showcase how one of our LCTQ sessions usually is run, where we sort of have a dialogic kind of uh, a take on this. Um, but for those of you who are interested in joining us in today's workshop, um, if possible, try to stay with us throughout the entire of the two sessions because they're interrelated. The first session will be introducing the idea of authentic assessment and how to approach it using LCT. Um, specifically using three different dimensions of LCT. Um, and uh, in the second part, we will draw on that background understanding that we have developed to explore as a workshop in those separate three separate dimensions before bringing it together to discuss what does it mean when we look at um, authentic assessment in three different ways. Okay, so we'll, we'll start off by talking about uh, why we're looking at authenticity, then move on to the what. Often um, a presentation might start the other way around, um, but as you'll see, the what is a bigger question. So we're just going to start off with our reasons and motivations to start with, uh, and then from what is, is authenticity, we move on to how to interpret it. And uh, at any point, if you have any questions or comments or um, insights from your own working practice or experiences, then um, please join our discussions. Yes, as Andrew has mentioned there, please feel free to be uh, part of the LCTQ team as what we normally do every week. So if you have any ideas, just speak out. And uh, if we find that part of the conversation um, will be covered in the second or the third questions, we can always hold back the questions and we will pick it up again at that point. So starting with you know, why, why look at authenticity? Um, from our reading and discussions in our LCT, 
Q group. We've, we've come to understand that it's um, a notion that sort of gained currency in the 1980s and has had and continues to have um, uh, in large influence on education, including higher education, and can be seen in education policy and practices, whether this is in um, graduate attributes that are sort of across universities, across de degree programs, whether it's in practices that are le lecturers are encouraged to uh, take up by uh, teaching and learning units. Um, and what we've been looking at in particular is authentic assessment. And there's sort of some crossover and relation here to work integrated learning. Um, and I suppose, Behind the movement is this idea that um, higher education should move away from atomistic learning, decontextualized learning, and that um, students should be able to apply this knowledge. Um, I suppose tied in with this is the notion of work ready graduates. Now, um, we understand that um, there is another group precisely on this. Um, uh, LCT 3.5, who is working on work integrated learning. Um, perhaps they might find it useful to have a discussion with us at some point, a conversation about this. We understand that authentic assessment is not um, exactly the same thing as work integrated learning, um, but we are also arguing in today's session that um, authentic assessment should not just be seen as an appendage to work integrated learning, but um, an assessment practice in itself that you know, should be explored uh, in its own right. And that it, I mean, on paper that it actually is, I, mean, I don't know if this quote is in our slides actually, Ken, but there is, um, you know, our university is a good example of an institution that has formalized authentic assessment, not just assessment, but authentic assessment, the full phrase, in our assessment policy, um, and, and also in many other um, support, academic development type resources that our institution offers. Um, so, you know, alongside that, the kind of, I suppose, um, educational question of, you know, quality of learning and what types of tasks are ultimately going to be useful for students in different contexts. There's also a policy narrative that uh, suggests that whether we kind of, whether we like it or not, it's on the table for discussion. And it clearly has, um, a huge amount of traction at the moment, uh, or in our context, it has a huge amount of traction. So I think uh, our involvement in the educational design space here and our exposure to it, certainly at UQ, uh, but also in conversations with others at other universities, um, the need to engage with that and to effectively problematize authenticity. I mean, sometimes it's, it's a bit of an eye roll thing. What is authenticity? But um, it actually matters, I, I think, in, in this case. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, so there are two components of it, as um, Andrew has mentioned earlier. On the one hand, um, it is often written into education policy. So that kind of reminds me of the point that Erica brought up yesterday about you know, policymakers and how uh, do we influence the way that policymakers in education you know, uh, can, can make a difference to the way that we practice um, assessment and, and pedagogy in a classroom. Um, but at the same time, it also informs our personal practice because many of us, you know, are, are sort of inspired, if you will, to take on um, authentic assessment in some form or other as something to uh, aspire towards. But in the spirit of uh, having a conversation here in LCT 3.5, I would like to uh, ask you guys who are uh, online right now, if you have come across the notion of authentic assessment in your institution um, and what do you make of it? What do you guys think? Any comments from anyone? Hey. Hey, Carl. Hi, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> I am currently, I, I knocked an entire cup of tea onto the floor whilst trying to do the interview just before you guys. <laughs> Um, because of a very aggressive fly, so I'm now trying to clear that up, which is why I'm walking around. 
um, yeah, no, I come across this, um, um, uh, but um, and I'm sure this is not at all uh, unusual. Is that it's something that's wanted, something that's axiologically charged positively. Uh, you know, this is something we do want. Authentic sounds good too. Who doesn't want? You know, who wants inauthentic assessment? But there's no real sense of what the hell that might be. Um, and I've certainly come across some uh, some real zingers of examples. So, not in my institution, but in the um, I was at the AARE, the Australian Association for Research and Education, a few years ago, and a paper was presenting about authentic assessment. And the authentic assessment was um, that you have to imagine yourself. And this is one that they'd use with their students. You have to imagine yourself as an FBI agent who's investigating um, alien sightings. That was supposedly the authentic assessment. So authentic to clearly to, you know, only the X-Files. <laughs> uh, and I've, that's not the only one like that that I've come across. Uh, so I think... The point being really is it's something that's wanted and sounds good, but um, I don't think there's much understanding of what it means, at least in my institution, people I've talked to. And I also think that it can be used very, very elastically to mean all sorts of things that involve some sort of scenario. Um, and that's it. That's, you know, that's my experience anyway. That's, it's interesting. Think, uh, what that makes me think of is um, if you go back in the authentic assessment literature, which has a sort of like interestingly precise starting point in 1988, um, as far as we're aware, at least. Um, the, I, I think what authenticity means in the, you know, the broad narrative of the literature has changed quite a bit in conjunction with the employment kind of imperative that has been rolling out. One of the interesting things about the early papers that were published maybe between 88 and, gosh, maybe 91, um, operating from memory here, is the things were quite open, I think, at, in the late 80s and early 90s in terms of what it meant. And you see um, this, like, this then new idea of authentic assessment contextualized um, against not higher education, but uh, American, um, pre-tertiary education, K-12 schooling and widespread standardized testing. Now, I'm not an ex expert in the history of that sector, but the papers at the time take a much, um, they are in some ways less scenario focused and more kind of complex generic skillsy in a sense. You know, you see things like problem solving and critical thinking and things like that coming out as examples of authentic assessment rather than scenario. So just a point of interest to me, the, just because you used the word scenario, how things have become scenario oriented in terms of authenticity rather than skill oriented. Maybe I'm speaking ahead of where our slides are going to go. Yeah, but uh, also it is my opinion. I, I, uh, I'm not representing Jack and Andrew here, but in my personal opinion, I think that as the notion of authenticity starts to get charged in the field, it just basically becomes sort of a totem that people are required to, you know, have. It's just become kind of a branding exercise. And generally there is a de-technicalization. It's just very hazy as to what exactly the principles should be or what the principles are. Hey, Ken, this is Lucy in New Zealand. Hi, Lucy. Hi, nice to meet you. Nice to uh, connect today. I just wanted to make a brief comment that certainly here um, in New Zealand, and I won't speak on behalf of my whole institution, the wording of authentic assessment is appearing in teaching and learning frameworks. The comment I want to make, though, is um, yes, it is becoming a tick box. is something that you have to do in the design. Two lecturers that I'm working with on two different programs where there's say an e-portfolio or some kind of reflective task, there is a direct connection between what they're being asked to do and then what they have to do in their ongoing professional learning as part of their practice after university. But what's interesting is that the lecturers, they know the connection between the assessment task and what, you know, life after, 
but they have both said to me, I mean, you know, two really different programs, that they don't necessarily articulate how the assessment task connects to something that might be authentic in a profession. I just wanted to make that, that comment that there's a design aspect and then to what extent is that made real and visible and meaningful for the students? Yep, certainly. Um, in fact, Jack, uh, we'll be exploring that in terms of, well, I mean, so basically in, when it comes to authentic assessment, we acknowledge that there is something useful going on there because it was initially set up sort of like a knee-jerk reaction, right, against the idea of people just simply rote learning, you know, textbooks, concepts, and memorizing definitions. So obviously there is something that is useful there and we don't really want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. But at the same time, you know, um, as you have mentioned there, you know, we've got to make this relevant for the students. We have got to make this um, equitable, importantly, for the students. So if as long as the notion of what authenticity means remains vague, um, then basically the uh, assessment principles or the assessment uh, you know, requirements are also just as vague. Any other thoughts from you guys? Yeah, I'd, yeah, I'd agree with that, Ken. And just building on what Lucy said, I suppose just because it's authentic doesn't necessarily mean it will be effective or successful. And I think Lucy's examples are good, uh, you know, is a good, makes that point quite clearly. Um, and similarly, and we might get onto this later uh, in this session, how it's, been set, uh, how it's been set up, and Ken mentioned the charging, axiological charging around it, it, and Carl mentioned it as well, it's often presented that the alternative is somehow inauthentic and not motivating and something undesirable. Um, and we perhaps also need to question that as well. There might be times when that sort of assessment is appropriate. So rather than just, you know, going with uh, putting our flag to, to this cause and going with this and excluding everything else, if we had a, a better understanding of its benefits and how to apply it effectively, we could then make a more informed decision yeah. around these assessments. We can see it as a positive open-ended thing rather than something that's kind of a, a closed you know, cone of something that's predefined and, and smacks of cookie, cookie cutterism. We don't want to end up there, I don't think. And I think it's, it is productively an open concept if we choose to dig into it. Well, of course, this harkens back to what Carl mentioned at um, you know, the opening address of LCT 3.5 about um, how to unravel these big dichotomies, right? So having assessment as either being authentic or, you know, God forbid, inauthentic. Um, rather, if we can explore the principles behind what authenticity means, find out what is useful, what is not, what is effective, as you mentioned there, let's say, you know, what is relevant to what the students are doing, and then see how that can be integrated into assessments, regardless of whether they are labeled as authentic or not. Um, but yes, uh, is there something you wanted to add, Lucy? Oh, um, just that that sounds great, what you're saying. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> we go to the next slide. Page. Is it, is it so, yeah, uh, so as we have already uh, suggested, the main problem of using authentic assessment or authenticity and to make it meaningful is the haziness around it. And this is something that, you know, is uh, not, not our own assertion alone, but rather, you know, it has already been observed ever since back to 1991 that authenticity has been used in multiple different ways. Was there anything else you want to add to that, Jack? No, not really. I mean, it's, it's an interesting, if you're like me and like re reading early authentic assessment papers for some reason, it is interesting to see that the, I think in that very paper, actually, um, Archibald notes that there are, you know, authentic assessment is a term that's stuck, but we also have had in history things like performance assessment, which is similarly nebulous. Um, one of my favorites is alternative assessment, 
<laughs> so these, these, I think these are ideas that had meaning at a particular place in time and authentic assessment has... has... We have lost sound. Oh, no sound. Testing, testing, testing. Now? Can anybody can else hear us? We have yeah, sound. We have, we have sound. Okay, I can hear sound. Okay, great. Um, yeah, all, all that to say, I think there, is, there must have, it's interesting to think about the, um, the way that there, there was clearly a, a movement, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s that has, was a push towards something different. And authenticity is the word that stuck, but it's not necessarily the total sum of what was meant at that time and what is potentially valuable now. Anyway, I'm rambling. So diverse um, definitions and changes over time. Mm -hmm. Now, as we have mentioned earlier, the um, you know authenticity is something that's worth exploring because it is really in there in our uh, education policy. If you have a look at your own institutions, you're bound to see some kind of a clause there as well. Just to give you guys an example, here is one that's taken from our own institution. As you can see, the definitions like this are generally quite broad. And it is really very open to individual, you know, coordinators to interpret how to make use of this. Um, but I think what is conspicuously absent are guiding principles, useful guiding principles that we can use to, you know, that we can consider when we are designing our assessments. Um, so as a useful way to start, we are drawing on Villarreal et al, which is um, a, a, a literature review article. Um, it is significant because it has taken into consideration, was it 112 12 pieces. Uh, pieces of um, authentic assessment literature um, articles in order to figure out what are the common themes uh, behind all these articles. Do you want to say more about that? Oh, only that, you know, this, um, this, this particular um, piece of research, it, it's a systematic thematic analysis of, of, of the literature on authentic assessment between 88 and 2015. And we found that particularly useful as a cornerstone for our discussions. And it's certainly, I think the reason we're bringing it up so specifically here is that it was for us a really um, an important launch pad for thinking about authentic assessment with LCT as will become apparent. Um, we don't necessarily want to get into the minutiae of the paper too much um, because it is a, a starting point and we're going to present some key points on the slide in a second that will help you to see the link to LCT. Um, but I, I think what is worth noting about this paper and if, if anyone's interested in it please write to us and we'll send you a copy of it um is that the many of the um other interesting pieces of literature recent pieces of literature on authentic assessment propose some version of a conceptual or theoretical framework for authentic assessment whereas virile and colleagues um really looked into the literature to see what came out as the main thematic content of it. And do you have those, Ken? Yep. Yeah. Bring those up. And they distinguished um, these three dimensions, not to be confused with the LCT dimensions, um, of authenticity based on what they found. Um, and th those are realism, cognitive challenge, and evaluative judgment. Um, and the split wasn't really very even in terms of where they saw the emphasis in the literature on authentic assessment. So they found that um, realism was by far the most uh, recognized dimension, if you like, in the literature. I think it was 71% of their, um, of the papers that they analyzed dealt with realism. Cognitive challenge was about half the papers, 55%. And then evaluative judgment uh, was reflected in about 38%. As I said, we don't want to get too stuck in what these things mean. Really what, what this provides to us is a starting point for looking at, um, I suppose, where, we, where the discussion is currently at um, around authentic assessment and what our next steps might be in terms of bringing 
again, po approaching that concept positively and looking at what steps we can take to get to those operating principles, those organizing principles, so that we can better make use of it. Do you want to? Um, also, a little bit of a disclaimer here. Um, we are not trying to make a case that authentic assessment should be this or that. We are not trying to make a case where, you know, uh, authentic assessment should be defined as this or that, right? Rather, uh, we are taking as a starting point what the practitioners themselves think about authentic assessment and to unpack those assumptions behind uh, their definitions, which is why we are, uh, you know, drawing on this um, on this literature review, right? We want to know, you know, it's, it's not our definition, but rather we want to draw on how people have thought about it and to just simply clarify it so that uh, it provides, you know, a sort of a common meta language, if you will, um, that can be shared across uh, examiners and assessment designers so that there is dialogue between them and it wouldn't just be a case of you know you're doing your own authenticity and I'm doing my own authenticity and we have nothing to do with each other you know um, so for example going into the first point that, that Villarreal has brought up um, realism they mentioned how these articles are talking about realism in terms of either an authentic context or an authentic task. And they differentiate these as two different dimensions of that same component. So for example, uh, having an authentic context is really having your assessment that mimics or simulate the context uh, of a problem. It helps to frame the problem, right? So instead of leaving things hazy as a very generic idea, uh, they, they believe that to have an authentic context is to populate your assessment, uh, for example, with an actual scenario, with actual people, with actual you know, problems to solve, um, with actual organizations, so on and so forth. Now, they distinguish this as being separate from an authentic task in a sense that um, a task will be some, something that you are required to carry out at the workplace or at, uh, you know, the, your site of employment itself. And just to give you an example, uh, this, by the way, this is uh, Villarreal's example, right? Um, you can um, presumably have, say, an authentic context without an authentic task. For example, if you are required to do um, a case study, Right. So a case study would presumably provide you with all the context to the extent that it can about the problem, about an organization, about the people involved, about, you know, and all that. But uh, you are not really required to write an essay based on the case study when you're at work. So the essay itself will be not an authentic task, but the contents of that essay could be uh, authentic context. An authentic task uh, would be something like, say, if you were to write a business report that you would normally be writing if you are working for that organization, if you are doing a business pitch uh, to you know, stakeholders in the same way as you might do, for example, if you are working for an organization. Now, of course, uh, it does get a little bit tricky, which we will explore in the second uh, session, uh, what this might mean in terms of, say, if you're a mathematician, right? Uh, what is a, an authentic context for a mathematician? What is an authentic task for a mathematician? And how can that be different from, say, if you're a musician or if you are, you know, um, uh, a market, uh, someone in marketing, you're an advertiser and so on. It can mean something quite different. So how can we, you know, uh, look at, compare and contrast their tasks and context across these disciplines? For example, um, would you like to say something? Yeah, uh, with, uh, shall I move on to cognitive yeah. challenge? That was the second theme they identified. And here they're really talking about um, the importance they found in the literature of linking theoretical concepts to everyday experience. So this idea of, of applying knowledge. Um, and they stress that you know this was a feature of the authentic assessment literature so they cited moving away from you know decontextualized 
uh, fragmented knowledge and being able to do things like problem solving, um, applying knowledge, uh, creating some sort of product or, or a concrete product is the term they used. Uh, and this relates to what they, what they found in the literature, the term transfer of knowledge. So this idea that what's learned in the university can be used in a real life environment in contrast to decon uh, decontextualized knowledge in an examination, which is somehow locked in there and, and, and can't be transferred. So the name cognitive challenge comes from um, what, what they found in the literature. And you'll be familiar with terms like higher order cognitive skills and Bloom and Anderson's uh, taxonomies. And so what they're seeing is, or what, they're, what they've seen in the literature, is this idea that these cognitive uh, higher order thinking skills are put into play as theoretical concepts are applied. So what, what they found really is the, the link between the theoretical concepts applied to everyday experience. So that's the, um, the, the, the key point for that one. Jack, can you tell us a bit about... Yeah, I, was, I, I don't have um, quite as much description to give of a value of judgment. It it's just happens to be the one that's sort of near and dear to my heart um, because I've spent some time with that idea in, in assessment generally. It's evaluative judgment um, is interesting because it's a concept that has been proposed in those words quite recently in 2017. Um, uh, there's another paper that goes into evaluative judgment. So it's interesting to actually see it turn up here as a main theme of, um, of authentic assessment. It's really about this idea that students um, become capable assessors themselves of the quality of their own work. So their students become capable of exercising evaluative judgment or their evaluative capabilities. That's the, the crux of the idea. Um, in many ways, I think this is for assessment generally actually a pretty sort of exciting territory at the moment. You're, if you were to do a Google Scholar search of evaluative judgment, you'll see things are um, blossoming in the last couple of years in that area. Um, but it, it has its, it similarly, it has its roots in some late 80s thinking about um, not only having putting students in contexts that are in some sense real world or authentic, but also asking them to make judgments that um, reflect an authentic or real world kind of set of skills as well. And uh, of course, you know, usually when we talk about authenticity or authentic assessment, many of us will have that, um, you know, uh, we, we, we tend to think of it in terms of realism. Mm. But actually, if you look carefully, you'll find that cognitive challenge and evaluative judgment is always part of that conversation. It's often used as sort of a justification of why we need to have authentic assessment and what you get out of authentic assessment. So, so if you think about how, uh, for example, in tertiary education, we are generally moving from um, you know, assessing skills to assessing, say, graduate attributes, um, and how you know, part of that uh, graduate attribute is always about emphasizing things like cognitive ability uh, on the one hand, and the ability to critically reflect, which is uh, sort of part of the terrain of evaluative judgment as well. Now, as I've brought up uh, earlier in this conversation, um, there's, of course, you know, something useful about the notion of authenticity. But at the same time, um, it gets clouded over when it gets turned into some kind of a badge of honor or, or, or totem. So there is a, a danger, if you will, of uh, a dichotomy. There's a danger of an axiology and ultimately a danger of totemism. So basically everybody just claims that their assessment is you know, authentic. I'm more authentic than thou, uh, without having any substance behind it, right? So an example that uh, Carl brought up 
you know, about how you can have an authentic assessment about being an FBI agent chasing after uh, aliens. Um, of course, that's not going to do the students any good, but it gets branded as authentic, nonetheless, just as, uh, you know, the fulfill the, the, the checkbox. Now, um, so why do we want to interpret authenticity using LCT? Um, as Carl mentioned yesterday, you know, it's really about um, unraveling authenticity in terms of a big dichotomy. Now, it is gradually being um, recognized, I, I should say, um, you know, by institutions that authenticity should not be seen as simply black and white, or even though I personally believe that the reason why they do that is in order to get more people on board and not be scared away by the term. Uh, but still, that begs the question of what sort of a continuum are we looking at, right? So if you can unpack that in terms of the LCT dimensions, that would be potentially one way to go. I do think, and just on that point, Ken's just reading the chat, which is why he's looking intently at the screen. Um, I think it, it is important to emphasize that, you know, the idea of authenticity as a continuum um, is, is not a terribly new thing. It's certainly the direction that we've been going for a while. So I, I would also wouldn't want us to, you know, be said to be declaring a hardcore dichotomous situation. Um, I think that's a little bit of a, a you know, <laughs> a disclaimer of some sort, I suppose, you know, but certainly the, um, you, you're, you're more enthusiastic about the dichotomy than me, I think, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it, it is what, it is part of the narrative and it is part of the implied, maybe the implied narrative, I should say. Well, I would say that along those lines, I'm keen uh, to apply what Carl has called, uh, you know, relational thinking um, and dynamic thinking to the notion of authenticity. Um, now, I noticed in the chat there uh, that the idea of discipline has been brought up a few times. So yeah, one of the biggest problems of you know, um, operationalizing the idea of authenticity is of course that authenticity can uh, take very different forms depending on the kind of discipline that you're working in. So I think that basically underscores the need for a meta language uh, that we can use to talk about, you know, what does it, what are these underlying principles that can be used to, uh, to even start comparing in the first place? Because if we are comparing to, across different disciplines with different definitions of authenticity, we are just going to be comparing apples and oranges, right? Which leaves us with the original problem of vagueness around authenticity. But if we can find underlying principles, organizing principles behind these different uh, disciplines, it provides us with the means to even start that conversation about discipline. So we, pro we are not claiming to be able to, you know, resolve or even try to uh, fully uh, examine what, how, how to compare authenticity across disciplines within today's session. But what we do want to do is to provide at least a foundation that we can then apply subsequently to conversations of those sort. Yeah. Oh, right. This is the point that I insisted on. And so now I have to speak about it. Um, <laughs> One of the challenges um, that I think we, anyone who's worked with LCT for any length of time eventually comes up against is um, deciding how fine grained or um, how close to dial in the, the magnifying glass on the, the phenomena of study, or the object of study and um, the data that we're using. And one of the tension points that we are grappling with, and, and this is an active discussion for us, we haven't uh, you know, arrived at a conclusion or anything like that, is this idea that um, assess, well, thinking about assessment as a practice. So we have been striving and um, striving to and experimenting with this idea of seeing, zooming out a little bit from a specific aspect of assessment. So for example, the rubric is a really common objective analysis. Um, to think about it a little bit more as a 
as a social practice and the various constituents that make it up that could be reflective of um or th of some aspect of authenticity so uh the reason that i insist that we have this point on this slide is that i i think it's important for us to take into account not just the um you know the specific list that we might be working with in terms of like a criteria list or some particular aspect of an assessment although i don't discount at all that that's a really important thing to look at closely usually um but rather just to keep keep things again open from a, a and flexible in a design thinking kind of way in terms of how we might work with lct to make sense of authentic assessment um you know do you want to add anything well, that, that is sort of a setup uh, for our next session with the workshop as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we are not so much as looking at specific artifacts of the assessment. Um, you know, how we often like to think of um, assessment as a rubric or assessment as a set of instructions, but to look at it, you know, as a practice. So we are taking more of a slightly qualitative, slightly ethnographic kind of an approach to look at how the entire thing comes together as a design i think part of our motivation in this too is to think about um the actionable potentials of the lct concepts and how we you know in our workplace sometimes end up in conversations with colleagues um you know just talking about how oh, have you thought about you know this about semantic gravity or something like that it could be really helpful for you with this situation that you're in and often that requires us either a light touch or some kind of uh what's the word like very tangible hands-on kind of a feeling to the concepts and we're always trying to um articulate their practical nature so i think it's also seeing assessment as a practice as a whole that involves people it involves artifacts involves oodles of different things that exist um including time as well um might be able to help us to generate some simple actionable um potentials for using lct to uh realize authentic assessments or to critique them if they're you know if we think that something could be better or that we are putting undue emphasis onto, onto a particular assessment task So we propose in today's session, uh, if possible, um, to look at authenticity or the notion of authenticity in three different dimensions, as uh, we have already alluded to, and I believe many of you already have uh, at the back of your head as you, uh, you know, as we have gone through the definition of authenticity earlier. So as you can tell, more or less, the idea of uh, authentic context and authentic task uh, could potentially be explored by the notion of autonomy. So to what extent uh, is the context and the task uh, derived from a workplace or a place of employment as opposed to being derived purely from um, tertiary education context. Um, in terms of, do you want to say anything? Semantics. Semantics. Uh, I'm sure those of you familiar with LCT and semantics, when I was talking about cognitive challenge, you, semantics probably sprang to mind and the uh, semantic wave linking theory and practice. When we read the literature review, that came to our mind and featured in our discussions. So that seemed like a, a good way to, to look at uh, that theme in the literature review. So yes. seeing it in terms of semantics the foreshadowing here is that when we move into breakout rooms in the next session to do a little bit more practical activity ken is going to lead the discussion on autonomy and andrew is going to lead the discussion on semantics and that leaves me with specialization which is i think maybe the aspect of lct that we've the dimension of lct that we've discussed least <laughs> in our group so i'm feeling uh, excited about that but it you know Specialization is about the um, the basis of achievement or the basis of achievement in a practice, and that seems to link up really neatly with this idea of um, evaluative judgment and the assessment of quality and what underpins that um, that assessment. So we'll be 
thinking in the next session about um, specialization as a, a lens through which to um, look at this idea of assessing quality and evaluative judgment. Um, but we will find out what it means because I don't really know yet. <laughs> Should we talk um, about the tasks and where you found them? Sure. I mean, so just uh, in terms of a little bit of um, timekeeping and whatnot, that brings us roughly to the end of our first um, third. Um, and in a moment, what we'll do is we are going to be moving physical locations between each hour. Um, we're on campus at UQ today. And uh, so in a moment, we'll take um, five to 10 minutes just to move uh, venues and get up set, get set up in our um, physical breakout rooms where we are. Um, but I think, um, Ken, do you want to say anything about the, um, the task that we'll be doing in the next um, session? Yep. So what we'll do is <clears throat> um, we will be providing you with a copy of the task that we will be looking at during the workshop. As you can see, uh, these tasks comprise, you know, these documents will comprise different components or different aspects of the task that you can look at as a practice. Um, don't worry, we'll put that on the chat in a minute. Um, but before we go, I thought that perhaps if we have a couple of minutes, mm -hmm. um, we would like to invite any kind of comments or feedback that anybody has. Please feel free to unmute yourselves and just have a chat with us. If you can hear me, good morning from Hi, Montana. Gina. Hi, I'm sorry to be coming in late, but um, interesting stuff uh, as usual. Um, yeah, this is uh, one of those uh, those subjects, right? So, um, yeah, uh, I, I'd like to come into the conversation as well um, in your little breakout room. Um, so I'm, I'm still trying to get my head around how it works. So when you do your little breakout room, uh, do you send an invitation that is separate? This is the the forum for the main for the main one, right? So, how does it work? so what will happen is uh, this is a good question actually, just in terms of the logistics of how this will work. Um, yeah. Is that we we are going to log off the main session in a moment and just physically walk ourselves over to um, another building here at UQ, um, and then when we, what will happen is we'll log back on. Um, and we'll initiate some breakout rooms once we've logged back on. And then anyone who's here um, can self-select which breakout room you'd like to go into, whether it's semantics or specialization or autonomy. And we'll provide um, a copy of the uh, example assessment that we're going to be analyzing or workshopping rather um, in those breakout rooms. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So if I just stay here, I you will come back on. Yeah, no, yes, Gina, so just, you don't worry. Everything's going to be sorted out for you. And just, guys, just make sure that uh, you use only, if you're having three, use only two breakout rooms and have one in the main session. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, by the way, Carl, uh, we are having a bit of uh, an issue, technical issue, trying to attach um, the file to the chat. Really? I'm not quite no, sure why that's the email it to the technical. Okay. Um, put it into a Google Doc and then um, share that link through the chat. Okay, that's a great idea. Um, a and then um, the other thing is um, you might want to actually think about maybe not having breakout rooms, but doing it in one session. So like this is a very awkward time of the day for most of the world. They'll catch up with it on video later. Um, um, I'm hearing from various people that people are saying that they're going to do that uh, for quite a lot of sessions uh, that are there, like 3 a.m. or whatever. Um, so if there's um, not a lot of people, then the best thing would be to have like just a couple and do a couple of uh, issues in one of them or something like that. That's what we did yesterday. Is we had um, we actually had a Sarah ran a, a much more interesting, engaging session, I think, because we had um, everyone together actually. So it kind of uh, works really pretty well. So just have a think about that as a possibility.
We're all nodding, so I think that's a good idea, and it actually means we can just stay in this room where we are. Um, yeah, you can stay in the room, just do it in one space, and then, yeah, and it actually ends up being a better kind of experience anyway. Great. So what I'll do is I'll put the examples um, that we'll be working with into uh, a Google Doc and link that to the chat momentarily. In the meantime, while I'm doing this technical thing, maybe you guys want to chat. Do we want to just run through these slides you've got up, Ken? Yeah, if anyone has any um, comments so far about, you know, just your general impression of authentic assessment as being used in your institution, please feel free to have a chat about it. Uh, yes, Penny. Thank you. Thanks very much, everybody. Um, the the those diff, those three different uh, themes that you've drawn out of the role, they're very to me. They feel very different in where they're located in the practice. Who's doing it? The the teacher or the student? I mean, the ordinary, I'd say, teachers coming to design a task. They're thinking first about the the uh, workplace versus curriculum continuum, um, but the others, what the students have to do, what the the long term um, acquisition of evaluative judgment, the things that are valued by the discipline. Um, I guess that belongs when the teachers are looking at developing ordinarily perhaps rubrics or themes in, in a strand. Um, yeah, they just, um, as part of the practice that they seem to be on very, in very different steps of the process, I guess. What do you think? Yeah, and it'll be useful to look at, you know, um, first of all, whether the curriculum is coherent, whether the practice is coherent, right? So um, uh, of the students are doing slightly different things. To what extent is there an overlap? To what extent, you know, they're just doing completely different interpretations? To what extent do they all come together, uh, for example, to make up different components of what the student is supposed to achieve. If I may, um, if I may add to the, to the rich discussion going on, just to pick up a little bit on what um, uh, Penny uh, just said. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Can you hear me? Right, so uh, yeah, I, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking about how we do it here. Um, I am program uh, assessor means that it means that we have to look at uh, a student learning outcome across time. So from year one to year four. So within one program, if we're looking at a student learning outcome, how do we assess it uh, across the years, right? Um, so this is talking about uh, perhaps, um, well, I think it, it goes both ways. Uh, whether it is a region or a non. Um, so so I, I haven't thought about the application of LCT in, in, in program assessment. Um, I think that's one of the things that we often don't talk about, the fact that we actually have to measure student learning outcome across time. Right. So, so things like program assessment is very different from a course assessment. So when we're talking about assessment, we probably need to differentiate between how a teacher comes in to uh, plug into that, you know, that long term student learning outcome across time versus something that is only specific to that course. Right. So this is one of the issues mm -hmm. that we, we face um, in our institution. Um, uh, it's, it's particularly diff difficult with particular programs like liberal arts, right? Where the student learning outcome is, whoa, right? Very, very big. Um, so I, I just want to, to, to put this on the table that, um, that you know, universities do need to, to think about. Um, um, I, I think the, the British talk about it in terms of uh, graduate attributes, but the Americans actually talk about it in terms of student learning outcomes. 
and that's measured across time from year one to, to exit point, right? So the capstone, for example, is going to be measured and freshman is going to be measured. The same learn, learning outcome across time. So I don't know when you're thinking about continuum, if that, if that helps. I, I'm, I'm um, really glad that you brought that up. I think it's such an, such an important point. And that, I think that's why one of the reasons that I've been so big on us thinking about assessment as a practice in our conversations here, as seeing it not as just an, not getting stuck at a particular level of magnification when we're thinking about assessment. I mean, one of the challenges um, that certainly I've rubbed up against in my professional roles over the last couple of years in talking about assessment has been the, the sense of the box that it gets put around it in a given conversation. So for instance, if we're working with somebody who is delivering a single assessment item on a single course they're teaching as a casually employed staff member, uh, and that's their kind of one involvement with, um, with a course potentially uh, in a semester, then that ranges through to um, the staff who might be, um, you know, in high level continuing positions who see it with completely different lens and then you have these different actors in the system who um have ra sometimes radically different values for what the assessment is intrinsic or extrinsic motivations related to the assessment um well i, I think i'm <laughs> agreeing with you and validating what you're saying mainly that i think it's important for us to consider that um yeah yep and uh, just to touch on the two points that you you know mentioned there uh, that I definitely, I, I certainly agree with. On the one hand, um, the usefulness of working at the practice level is that you can define the scope of the practice, right? So you can look at the single uh, course as a practice and how that practice fits into the larger practice at the program level. Um, the other important point, of course, is that if you are looking at practice as in general, of course, you can talk about uh, your course or your program consisting of curriculum of pedagogy of assessment and that you know assessment basically fits into all these other aspects of that practice as well but at the same time i think that it cannot be emphasized enough the importance of looking at assessment simply because assessment tends to drive the motivation of you know um, both in terms of student learning as well as in instruction, I mean, to some extent. So uh, not having a clear direction as to what assessment is doing is basically not going to uh, do both pedagogy or the design of curriculum any good. And the other interesting thing, I think, to lump in with this, and maybe I'm foreshadowing some autonomy discussion here, um, is, the, is the, the very kind of... Um, macro level conversation around assessment as distinct from learning which is you know if you've spent any time with the um the assessment in higher education literature especially the assessment for learning literature um you you see these arguments for the collapsing of the boundaries between assessment and the rest of what goes on in um, institutions of learning and that is, is a, still a really current discussion to engage with because it's well and good to to make the claim that that's what we're after and personally i lean in that direction i think it's it is um it is valuable to see assessment as part of a course or a curriculum of learning rather than as a an add-on um maybe there are some specific compliance exceptions to that but the doing of that is really really hard in a situation where um we have um a community where each individual has quite a bit of a, a certain kind of autonomy to operate how they like within their course and not necessarily to engage with um design in the broader sense across a, a program or a within a faculty or something like that um, did you want to take a, a five minute yeah. water stop before we get into the next discussion? I think because we're opting to do this in one room rather than uh, to go into the breakout rooms, which I think is actually a really good suggestion. Um, that might mean that our discussion is a little more extended. We had originally slated
the next hour for um, a kind of analytical workshop discussion and then another hour for presenting those kind of results. But because we won't be going to breakout rooms, that means we can just sort of keep talking. And I think our analy the analytical workshop component might therefore stretch for a little bit longer than an hour before we get to a maybe a bit more of a free form thing at the end. The benefit of this is that it will all be recorded, I think, in one place which would be wonderful for us. Um, but I think it's just a consideration for us to take into And uh, has, have the task already been? I've sent the first one okay. and I think we'll see. Let's see how we go with that and we can send another one if we want to. Um, Should we ask, has everyone got the task? Yeah, that's so that we can... In so, the chat, there's a link in the chat and that should take you to a PDF of an authentic yeah. assessment task. And after the break, we'll come back together and, and have a look at that together. Yeah, so if you uh, would like to make use of the time during the break, other than having, you know, standing up and uh, having a little stretch, um, you could also make use of the time to have a look at the task first beforehand, um, before we get into the workshop itself. So we'll see you in about five minutes and I'll put our links. We've actually got two tasks. We'll start with one and if we get to the second one, we'll see how we go. But I'll put the links into the chat again and I'll do that again in 10 minutes or so for anyone who... Uh, so we'll see you in five minutes. Thanks. Thanks very much for the first hour. Thanks everyone. See you soon.